I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Ryan Graves, former Navy pilot, AIAA community chair, and quantum technology project manager. Ryan has worked in advanced technology operations for over 10 years, including experience with BA Systems Fast Lab and his current role at GenMAP. Prior to that, was twice deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Inherent Resolve as an FA-18 Super Hornet pilot. Ryan has gained media attention as one of the Navy pilots coming forward to speak about their UAP experiences, which he joins us to discuss today. So Ryan, welcome. I think that everyone is excited to learn about your UAP experiences, but before we get that, I want to start in, I want to get into some background. You've got a lot of technology experience, first at BA Systems Fast Lab, developing new tech in conjunction with DARPA, AFRL, and other research institutions. But you're currently working at Quantum Generative Materials to accelerate the creation of breakthrough materials and tech through quantum algorithms. Can you tell me a little bit about these current roles? Yeah, absolutely. And first off, Tim, thanks for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, so, you know, starting at my current role now at uh, Quantum General Materials or GEDMAT, um, GEDMAT is a quantum technologies company. You know, uh, you hear a lot of quantum computing, you know, we're looking to take advantage of that quantum computing. And the, the area that we're focusing initially is really around the many body problem and our ability to kind of move the state of the art beyond our current ability to predict material properties, uh, design materials. Um, it's, you know, in the, in the silicon industry, um, manufacturing industries, um, it's kind of hit or miss when you're looking for new materials. Uh, it's our contention that we'll be able to uh, develop a system that will allow us to uh, design materials based on uh, needed properties uh, with our algorithms and our AI. So um, we're kind of working in that post uh, density functional theory DFT world uh, bridging the gap before we have a true um, high quality, low error quantum computer that we can take advantage of. So that's the gap we look to bridge. Uh, my previous job at BA Systems uh, Fast Labs, um, that's kind of their advanced technology group within their electronic sector. And within there, I was in their autonomy uh, control estimation group. And once again, within there, their planning and autonomous control technologies group. Uh, and so what my role was there was um, essentially to use my tactical experience uh, and my um, general understanding of high tech uh, based off of my uh, experiences in the jet and just, you know, my professional uh, life in order to uh, develop capabilities uh, in conjunction with DARPA and AFRL looking, you know, at the 10, 15 year horizon. Um, so, you know, I worked in a lot of programs such as Air Combat Evolution 1. Uh, which was a, a program um, sponsored by DARPA to have an autonomous dogfighting capability in a jet. So um, that's kind of one example where I was responsible for uh, winning that program. And then I, I functioned essentially as Fast Labs principal investigator, working a team of engineers in order to actually accomplish uh, our objectives there. Ah, okay. well, it, it, the reason I wanted to start out with those is, it, especially on the UAP issue, I, I think the fact that you have technology experience and expertise, I think that's highly relevant, right? Because it, 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 it I think it helps provide context for your experience, you know, and it, it helps demonstrate that you have knowledge of what cutting edge technologies are, so you're able to better identify them and stuff like that. Now, so the, the other thing I want to stress for the audience is your qualifications as naval aviator. Again, you're a former FA-18 Super Hornet pilot, qualified as a combat lead, uh, head landing signals officer, forward air controller, and as a rescue mission commander. So I, I should definitely thank you for your service. And, and also, I'm wondering if you could share a bit about your background in naval aviation with me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I joined uh, the Navy right out of college. Uh, I joined by Officer Candidate School or OCS, uh, and I essentially signed up to be a pilot. I apply as a pilot, so if I didn't get in, I would have, you know, applied again. Um, that was kind of the advantage of going OCS. Um, so I went in, I applied as a pilot, I got in, succeeded through Officer Candidate School, ended up in Pensacola, Florida, uh, where I met my future wife, like uh, many a naval aviator. Uh, <laughs> went through my initial uh, training in Pensacola, Florida, and then I was shipped out to Corpus Christi, Texas, where I did my primary flight training uh, in the T-45. Uh, it's now being flown in the T-6, uh, but uh, it was right prior to that transfer. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, out of that training 
to get selected for Jets. Um, you know, it's really, you know, the needs of the Navy, what's available versus, you know, our desires, of course. Um, they came, I, I distinctly remember it. there was about 12 of us in our class and about 80% or so wanted uh, Jets, uh, it called Tailhook at the time. Um, the other the alternatives were helicopters um, and some big wings, kind of like P3s. Um, and not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but this particular class, they just were a jet heavy class. Uh, the instructor came in, um, he said, well, here's your first lesson in the Navy is that you don't always get what you want. And then <laughs> uh, they just said, uh, and they actually called my name first, Ryan Graves, Meridian, Mississippi, uh, Tailhook. And then that was the only jet picked for that class. So I got extremely fortunate. Uh, that particular selection. And it's just, you know, it's the needs of the Navy at the end of the day. So then I went to Meridian, Mississippi, where I trained in the T-45 Charlie. Uh, and that took me into my jet for the first time into a, a, a T-45 Goshawk, which is a, a single engine, uh, just slightly subsonic uh, aircraft that we do aircraft carrier landings on. Um, we drop uh, dummy bombs. We do our first dog fighting. And so it's pretty capable jet, um, but it is still just a trainer. Uh, once I graduated from there, I went to uh, VFA 106, the, the RAG or Fleet Replacement Squadron for the F-18 Super Hornet. I was there for a year. Um, I finished up Priority Alpha, which means I uh, was eligible to go directly to a deployed squadron. Uh, and I, I did just that and joined VFA 11, the Red Rippers, uh, mid-deployment uh, in 2012 while they were engaged in Afghanistan. Hmm. I think I flew my first combat mission about a week and a half or two weeks after I finished my, uh, my rag training. Yeah. So you have a lot, I mean, and again, I want to stress that for the audience, you have a lot of experience you did. I mean, you were deployed twice, right? So hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's really just my kind of training background. You know, once I got to the fleet, um, you know, I was a landing signal officer. So uh, one of my jobs was I would literally be responsible for the safe and expeditious recovery of aircraft uh, behind the boat. Uh, you know, I had a team of LSOs. Uh, I was responsible for training them up uh, for, you know, no kidding, picking up the radio and talking those guys down uh, behind the boat, as well as training uh, new LSOs to do that as well. Um, I was the forward air controller airborne, which is a qualification two or three air crew in a squadron uh, may get. And essentially would allow me to take operational control of a certain airspace and to utilize other assets such as artillery, naval gunfire, uh, other F-18s, other assets in order to uh, conduct, to, to orchestrate uh, strikes uh, in a combat zone. And then my uh, rescue mission commander training was a, um, a follow of the forward air controller. So you should pick one or two of the forward air controller crews in the entire air wing to go through this rescue mission commander training. And essentially it's an advanced uh, large force strike, uh, or I say accelerated large force strike training exercise uh, where myself, my WIZO would be responsible for uh, about 20 F-18s, um, a lot of other air assets, uh, rescue teams, helicopters, and we'd be doing simulated rescues with uh, pilots that were actually on the ground. So we'd fight our way in, fight our way out, the helicopter rescue, and we'd be orchestrating it the whole way. Uh, it, was, it was super privileged to do. It was an incredible experience to be able to do that. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a blast. Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, so, and so this, this really, again, I'm trying to set the stage for UAP. So I, I want to move on to that next, but so you, you've got the background. I mean, you have the Naval aviation background you, in, in spades, you have tons of it. And, and again, thank you so much for your service to our country. You've got the technology knowledge, right? And so I, I think where, where most people who are familiar with you, where they kind of come into this was CBS 60 Minutes. And what, what you told CBS was you saw UAPs every day for at least a couple of years in restricted airspace off the Atlantic coast. So I'm wondering, could I kind of start with that experience? And could you tell me a little bit more about what you meant or what you saw? Yeah, sure. So... I regret using the word saw, and I only say that because for me, the the jet is an extension of our bodies when we're up there, you know, once we strap in. But, you know, when we say saw, I, I'm including all our, our sensors and capabilities on the jet itself. So uh, when we were initially flying, when I initially got to uh, BFA 11, as I said, we were on deployment. When we came back, uh, we ended up going through a maintenance cycle because our jets were one of the few aircraft that were plumbed for the proper coolant flow and whatever you know electronics are needed for the ASA radar upgrade not a fresh install of an ASA but an ASA upgrade um, there's only a few squadrons that were slated for that um, 
so we were flying at, you know, some days with APG 73, and then later in the day, we'd be flying with the APG 79. Uh, and that's not particularly rare. It's rare in the fleet, but that's what happens in the fleet replacement squadron all the time is that you fly different jets with different radars. So it's not that, you know, special, but it was interesting that at this time for us, we'd be in the jet and we would, we would not see anything in the area, right? We'd see our wingmen and we'd have them in the data link, which is, you know, just shared data. Uh, we have it from our own jet information, such as a radar. Um, and, you know, on our situational awareness page or really just the moving map, right? We have a little box essentially drawn over the area that we're supposed to essentially belong in, right? That we've scheduled and we've checked into and we have, um, the right to be there. And we're maintaining something called MARSA, which is military tombs uh, responsibility for separation of aircraft. Um, and so these working areas out there aren't necessarily restricted space per se, uh, but they are military MOAs. And um, if you're in there and there's F-18s in there, you know, people are going to be yelling at you. You know, you don't just kind of like wander through it accidentally. Um, the difference between that and a restricted airspace is really more of the repercussions you face when you land, right? So mm. like, it's not like a restricted airspace has an aerial fence around it, right? Or there's like fighter jets waiting to go. I'm sure that's the case some places, but um, you know, it's just more of like a, you really, you really done screwed up now versus, <laughs> you know, you went in the wrong area and didn't know there was jets in there. So, you know, we know who's supposed to be in those areas, right? We have all the systems to, tell us who's in there because being able to tell who is who in the zoo, as we like to say, is one of the primary responsibilities we have. Um, because if you think about it, our radar screen, our SA page, I mean, that's our barrel of our site, you know, that's our gun. So when we select targets on that and we're receiving information from offboard uh, sensor platforms or from, uh, you know, radar controllers on a E2D, we have to take that information, correlate that on our radar because, you know, it's us, you know, putting the barrel up, onto a jet. And so it's incredibly important, as you can imagine, to make sure that we understand exactly who is who there. So, um, you know, when we go in with the APG-79 and all of a sudden we start seeing all these different radar contacts that weren't there in another aircraft, it's, it's, it's definitely a, hey, you know, what's going on here situation that should not be happening. Um, there are times when there will be false tracks uh, in the older radars, typically, such as for weather or, you know, perhaps some weird reflections, but uh, the uh, ASA radars weren't uh, supposed to be susceptible to that type of um, interference. Um, but, you know, that was our natural assumption was that these were most likely some, you know, false tracks. Um, when we point our radar at something, all our sensors look at it for the most part. So, you know, eventually someone had one of these locked up and they were near enough that they actually were able to pick up on their FLIR that there was energy emanating from that spot that the radar was pointing at. So, at this point now, it's been a, you know, holy smokes, you know, there are physical objects here, you know, we can't, we can't assume these are just, you know, false tracks now, if we're looking out there and seeing, seeing energy coming from that spot in the sky. Um, and so that was actually a little scary, right? Because, you know, there's people flying out there with a different radar system. It's like, are these things, we're, now we're actively avoiding these things, whereas only, you know, maybe 50% of the squadron can, can see them, right? So uh, a little nerve wracking there. Uh, eventually, we did actually um, see them with our own eyeballs. Um, people, of course, once they saw something there, they would try to fly up to them. Uh, just yesterday, uh, in the intelligence committee hearing, um, we we saw how you know they showed an example of how fast a pass can be. Right? Uh, there was a video; it's just one frame with an object in it, perhaps two frames, but. Um, we would fly by and look for these objects. And although they do go quick, that's exactly what we're trained to do. We go to a merge with another jet. We're looking to see if the air is condensing around their wings, if their flaps are automatically scheduling down, like if their AOA is high, so they're low energy. Like these are things we're looking for. Uh, and so to come to a merge and have all our sensors locked on something and have a circle in our, our Jehemix helmet to show us where to look and then not see anything, uh, it's disconcerting, uh, you know, to say the least. Um, but then just so happens that uh, a squadron mate of mine was flying with their wingman out to the working areas that I've been describing. And you always enter at a certain geographical spot and you exit at the same spot, but at a lower altitude, right? So it's like crossing traffic like this. Then these guys go home, these guys enter the area. And that's how it goes. Those are called the working rules for the area. Every working space in the military has one. Um, my, my friend, my squadron mate was flying out to the area. He was at that entrance point and one of these objects went right between him and his wingman, his other aircraft. Um, 
I have a contention, although I don't have this data that he, his radar wasn't working because he would not have flown directly into the object if his radar was. So I, I wonder if perhaps neither of the objects, <laughs> you know, either the jet or the object knew that the other was there perhaps because it wasn't putting energy onto into the contact. But either way, there was an object right at the entrance to that working area and split their section. And, you know, he, come back, he came back to squadron um, and, you know, had a look of shock on his face and I'm still in his gear, which, you know, is never good if someone's sitting in the ready room with their gear on because it means something went really wrong or some, you know, someone crashed or who knows. But um, he was just like, I almost hit one of those damn things, you know, it's, and he, he's just like, also, everyone's like, well, what would it look like? And he just described it as like a dark gray cube or black cube inside of a clear sphere somehow that was touching the circumference or the, you know, the inner 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 circumference of the the sphere there so but i don't know what a clear sphere looks like right it um what that really translates to in reality because if it's perfect clear you want to actually see it so um translucent i guess would maybe be a better word yeah so so a, a, a kind of a dark gray cube and kind of a clear sphere and and then I, again in washington post when they talked about this you, I, I believe you you'd said that these things had they had no exhaust plume no visible engine and then on one occasion appeared to be kind of hovering if if that's correct most um, of the time they'd be hovering yeah most okay. of the time they would be uh hovering uh just staying in a single location when i say hover you know, typically when you think of a hover, there's two things. There's either kind of the, I'm staying in one spot over the ground, or there's, I'm kind of just going with the wind at a, at a constant altitude. Um, one is much harder than the other, right? Uh, and these things would typically be stationary over the ground, regardless of the wind, which was, you know, interesting. Because even if you're in uh, an aerial vehicle, you know, you're usually bobbing around to some degree, you know, it's not that precise, but these things just kind of seem planted there, you know, in some sense, which was interesting, but we would see them, you know, flying around 0 0.6, 0 0.8 Mach doing just kind of random directions. Um, I, the times I would see them faster, 1.1, 1.2 Mach would typically, or I think exclusively, I saw them heading east or, you know, southeast or towards the ocean. Never saw them transiting west towards the land, never picked them up on the radar over land strictly strictly east of the land okay okay and yeah and and you're yeah, actually you're this is incredibly valuable information you're jumping around on my questions a little bit so if i get lost right. that's that's on me but um so what one of the things i wanted to ask was did did the uaps that you encountered respond to you or other naval aircraft anyway did they did they attempt to pace you evade or maintain a distance or anything along those lines not to me personally. Um, I have not had that experience. Um, the only reaction that I've suggested, I don't necessarily have evidence, but you know, one of the theories I have is that you're know, coming to that merge that I described, right, with the object in the jet. Um, I have a I have a bubble around me essentially where anything down here I can't see really, but anything up here is like I'm looking at the sky, right? And so you know, it's hard to tell as you're coming up to this object so fast. And you're trying to go slow, but you're going up too quickly just a slight descent from it will get it out of your vision pretty quick. And it was, it was just hard to tell, you know, was it moving in close? Was it, you know, was, it's just difficult because we could just never see them. I mean, I, I, dozens of pilots that visually went out and tried to see them and I know only a handful that were successful. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, so I, I, I want to try and contrast this to the well-known Nimitz battle group in Canada, south of California coast, because those have gotten so much publicity. I think people have studied the heck out of those. So in those, some pretty remarkable UAP flight performance was measured, including what, what appears to be speeds of, and again, I think this was radar descent on Kevin Day's systems for the most part, but, but they estimated that at around 24,000 miles per hour. So in your encounters, I think you just mentioned top speed of something like Mach 6.8, but it was, uh, what kind of flight performance, I guess, did you see displayed from these things? What, what are the capabilities appear to be? Yeah, so um, what we would, like, I would typically see them stationary, or what we would see is operating somewhere in the 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 Mach. So what that translates somewhere around, like, maybe like 250 to 350 knots. Um, and then that's, that's all well and good, not that sexy, right? But they'd be out there all day, right? Um, for a tactical jet like ourselves, we can maintain that, you know, depending on what side of the range they are for maybe like two hours, right? Um, and then they would be at that range and then they would be at 1.1, 1.2 Mach. I didn't see them go from like 0.6 and then accelerate out to like 1.2 Mach. I wish I did, but 
you know, we're out there doing our mission. And, you know, as we're looking at our screen or radar, we happen to maybe go 180 degrees out. And now I'm getting flashes of them over here doing something, you know, and then we're turning back over here. So it's not like we're just sitting there studying them for like a long period of time. I think people sometimes have that misconception, um, you know, in hindsight, right? Like, it's like, you know, it'd be like, yeah, let's go out and like, think of all the data we could have got. But, you know, at the time, it's always just like, you know, 95 to 99% of your mental capacity is being used to do your mission and to, you know, operate safely. That just gets filed away as a safety consideration. You know, it doesn't get filed into some curiosity bucket, you know, that we have time or space or energy for. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I and I think it's really important that you point that out. I, I think a lot of people miss this. I, I, it's something that we know, but I think that we kind of miss, which is that these are, and I, I think this probably applies to the military in general. These are exceptions, right? I mean, you have your job that you're trying to do, and this would be across the military as a whole. You know, you've you've got a mission, you've got your job, you've got your duties. And then something happens and, and it's an exception, you know, and I think for the people who are studying and reporting these, right, like the UAP task force and stuff, I think that's one of the things that makes their job so difficult is, you know, even though these get in hindsight, these get the press at the time, they're, they're exceptions to a normal process and they don't get, you know, the reporting isn't necessarily there and all sorts of stuff like that. So I think that's really worth pointing out. It's like you said, your mental capacity is focused on something else. And then all of a sudden something happens. So, you know, and yeah, you know, it's a very important point. And it was mentioned at the hearings just the other day, you know, as enthusiastic as the, the Department of Defense may or may not be about this, at the end of the day, they're, they're, you know, mission is very clear. Um, and any science that they may or may not do is, you know, is for a particular goal, right? It, you know, so it might, it, they made it very clear themselves that, you know, they have, they really have to treat this, you know, as a threat. They're not an exploratory, you know, organization. They're, they're not incentivized that way. Um, so in my opinion, um, I think that one of the best things we can do moving forward is to, you know, we can't get away from the reality that the military currently has the best sensor technology. That's just the fact of the matter. And that's where the data is going to be held. So if the Department of Defense recognizes that they're not, not the right people to do science, which I think is, you know, I think, I don't think anyone's going to say that's a controversial take, right? That's why we have NASA. That's why we have other organizations, the science, National Science Foundation. Um, we need to be able to take that data and we need to be able to break it apart and deep decompose it down until it's it's unclassified so that we can spread the science out to the organizations that can actually do science and allow the defense for the department of defense yeah well and what you're describing so i mean these things and again i'm, I'm just kind of going down my list of questions here but these this so far what you've described this sounds artificial it sounds like a, so an artificial object, maybe a vehicle or something like that. But I mean, you're, you're describing, and this is what I was going to ask next. So you've got, I'm, a, you've got radar tracks, you've got FLIR, you've got visual confirmation. And then I think one of the other things that's interesting is, it, it, as you've said, the, these objects were stationary and sometimes, or they were moving, they're not moving with the wind. They're, they're obviously not like weather balloons or something like that, you know? So, I mean, you've got all of the hallmarks of real concrete physical objects, and these, these physical objects are moving under their own power, and, and they're not doing it conventionally. You know, that's, I mean, that, that's kind of my take on what you've told me so far. Yeah, you know, it, it's, I know it's very common for people to think about, they go to assumptions like balloons and things of that nature, but, you know, 25, 30,000 feet, you know, we don't get party balloons up there, just hang out. Like those things don't go up that, that high. Um, so, you know, we also need to consider that if there are things up there, right, that, you know, what that leads to isn't just that, okay, well, it must be aliens. And it's that if something's up there, like it's worth our attention. Like that's, that's really the point, right? Whether it's, it's something that fits into the other category or whether it's some type of uh, collection operation by a foreign country, like, you know, we, we should be asking questions about our security if there's things operating in that range right off our coast and our military ranges. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it, it actually, that was, again, I was going to ask about that. Let, let me come back to that one. <laughs> I subconsciously on. got your questions in my head, I guess. There, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, it, what, what I wanted to ask next was, um, you know, because these encounters happened repeatedly over time, and I thought this was really interesting, right? And this goes to the exceptions part of it, because, um, you know, again, with a lot of this stuff, it happens and then it's done and then it's gone. And you're left asking all these kind of questions. But since yours happened repeatedly over time, I was wondering if you noticed any common patterns, right? Like time of day or flight paths or geographic location. I think you mentioned that they didn't seem to go over land. They seem to focus on the ocean. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Um, one thing that I have an uncertainty about is collection bias. So, you know, are, are the, you know, a suggests in an F-18 off the training range is seeing UAPs that are there, or are they just seeing they, you know, they're seeing what's, you know, distributed more broadly, yet they have the detection capabilities there, right? So I think to preface this conversation, we we have to acknowledge that the data we have is coming from a narrow subset. Um, so pattern recognition may be difficult. And, you know, I think that should be a goal of, you know, efforts in the future in order to broaden the domain of understanding across, um, you know, the continent of the United States, as well as the coast. Uh, and I think, you know, bringing in other agencies is going to be key to that. Um, I forgot the context original question, although I had the uh, setup there. Oh, please remind yeah. Me? Well, no, it's just it, it basically patterns. Pa you oh, yeah, know. patterns. So, yeah. So to say that, you know, so to, to, to preface it with that, right, the things that we would see is that, yes, they weren't over land. I would see them going fastest when they were kind of just barreling east out over the ocean. Um, you know, we would see them kind of just east. I mean, I it weren't like they were only in our area and then they weren't like I would see them kind of working their way east. Right. So like there was. There was traffic going this way. It wasn't just like they're in this one box and that was it, right? Um, we'd see them kind of circular patterns, more extended racetrack patterns. We'd see them perfectly stationary. Uh, we'd see them kind of doing one of these or just kind of drifting up, right? So we'd see them climbing or descending or vice versa, right? They'd just kind of be doing like one of these up and down. So there'd be some like three-dimensional uh, variability in the maneuvering, not just in the horizontal axis. Um, and so like, what is this all, you know, what is the pattern? I don't know. Um, uh, but it was, you know, it was strange. It wasn't just like one particular speed, you know, it wasn't like super fast and then stationary, right? Like a, a go and a stop, right? It was, uh, less organized than that, I would say. Um, and ultimately you don't know what the objective is, right? So that's what could be difficult with like, you know, one of the things I worked on a little bit at BAE was, you know, swarms, things of that nature, right? And being able to tell the objective what a swarm is focusing on its attention on is different than trying to understand what a single sensor is focusing on. Right. And so um, when we do start to maybe perhaps look at this in a broader context as uh, you know, swarm behavior versus the actions of individuals um, maybe the patterns will become more clear. Um, I, have, you know, just to continue though, I have seen, you know, visual confirmation I'll say of, of similar objects in different areas, right, by similar aircraft. So, you know, up in the Pax River area, closer to Washington, a uh, friend of mine was flying up there, uh, had a radar contact and he basically was flying along. He saw it there and then he was like setting up for his test and, and he wasn't on his radar anymore. And then he caught a visual of something and he basically spotted what I was, I was like paralleling his jet. And then it just kind of went up and out of his view and it just looked you know, similar to how I've already described it with the cube in the sphere, you know, so I have heard of the, the appearance being similar uh, across the coast and in different, you know, training ranges mm. or pattern goes. Well, so another thing that, that it kind of intrigued me was um, I, I've heard, I, I, you know, I can't confirm this, but I've heard that the, the, the recent spate of UAP encounters, right? And I think this, this is probably the Nimitz one. These came largely after equipment upgrades in the early 2000s. And, and I, I've heard it suggested that, that that might indicate UAP cloaking from older aircraft sensors. I'm wondering, did you ever see any indications of stealth or radar jamming or, or electronic countermeasures, ECM type stuff? I never witnessed any emissions from any of the objects other than IR energy. Um, so no indications of jamming or, 
communication, I would say, you know, I not, you know, just no energy essentially at all other than IR energy, which was unmodulated, right? Just continuous, not like a signal or anything like that, just like a output. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I have. Mm, I guess the answer okay. is no. Okay. No, that's it's it's interesting. I I just wondered. I'm I I, I believe. Um, in fact, I think that in the hearings they mentioned this that there there were emissions detected, but I don't think they were specific about what those were. So mm -hmm. that could be a lot of stuff, and that could be stuff that maybe even my jet's not detecting, or you know, who knows? It could be um, be a lot of different things, um, and it can also potentially be you know a bounce back of the radar. It's bouncing off the object and the object's doing something to that signal and it's coming back and it's looking different and that coming back is a shift to doppler right theoretically if some unless you know yeah you said we'll just pretend it's a doppler radar but um you know it it comes back and it looks different it's been shifted it's um and the system may or may not you know display that as jamming but it could just simply be the effects of whatever the object is or how it's being propulsed or, or oh, whatever what right yeah, yeah yeah so so something could be misinterpreted right they could say okay this is an emission or this this looks like ecm or, or you know who knows the jets what. only has like a very narrow amount of stuff it's going to display right it's either jamming or it's not you know it's not like it's like yeah interesting yeah. data but it's not jam right like so we don't see that so it's going to be called jamming but who knows what that really is right that that makes sense that makes sense yeah and and um, you know, and, and again, I, I, I don't think in the, like in the hearings, which is probably where I got most of my information, I don't think they ever said jamming. I think they just said they detected emissions and that, that, that could include what you just described. It could just be kind of a steady state IR output. So, um, but one of the reasons I, I kind of asked about that was, um, I, I was trying to go towards the possible intent of these UAPs. I mean, did you get the impression? I know this sounds odd because they seem artificial and it seems like they're, you know, again, they're flying under power. But um, did you ever get the impression that they were under intelligent control? Did you ever have any thoughts about what, what <clears throat> they might want or why they might be interacting with our naval forces in the way they have been? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? You can, there's just so many assumptions you have to draw and they're just, they're just all very heavy assumptions. You know, I, I, and not only do we have to draw assumptions, we're also dealing with something that inherently may not be logical to us, right? <laughs> like if we want to look like at the far end of the spectrum, right? So, um, you know, I, it's, it's difficult to say, but I think really what's going to help us, you know, have a better understanding of that next layer, right, of the tactical implications of their maneuvering, right? Um, if we can, if we can zoom out a bit and, and, you know, have a better understanding of how these objects are moving in a group or how they're working perhaps as a swarm, you know, there are some ways of potentially, you know, inferring what um, their intent is or what their, you know, main objective or look area or something of that nature potentially. Uh, but, you know, to be able to do that layer of data, you know, at the AIA, that's, you know, one area we're considering, but it requires more data than we have right now, which is why we've been pleading to people that uh, are in Congress and the Senate that have supported the NDAA amendments um, to hopefully come and, and support uh, our efforts there to help us uh, unlock some of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the reason I'd asked about that, and this is probably the only, I, I would say that this is the only paranoid question that I have. This, this is the only one, that, it, but this did occur to me, and this came after reading the, the Nimitz encounters, is that, um, you know, on, on a cultural basis, I think, when we think of, of UAP or the, you know, the older term UFO, right? I mean, the one that I always think of is, you know, something touches down in this rural cornfield and picks up a farmer and there's nobody around, to, you know, there's, you've got one person doing testimony. But, but the, the reality of UAPs is these encounters appear to be happening off the coast in proximity to major population centers. And, and that, that strikes me as really intriguing, especially since these are happening in crowded airspace and near major shipping lanes, right? So I don't know, I, I, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, I, it's tough to tell, right? Because again, it kind of, most of our large population centers are located on, on the coast. Um, so it, it kind of gets back to that, that bias. Um, 
I'm, you know, I would love to see, and I think the UAP task force even had mentioned this, right, that they didn't have the data inside the continental U.S. that they did along the coast, right? Um, I will say that, you know, I've heard through some of my friends that are still flying that, you know, these are being detected, you know, further inland. They're just being detected at places inland that jets fly and have the detection capabilities. So, okay. you know. So again, it goes right back to, you know, are they hanging out by that base or are they, you know, are the jets seeing them because they're the jets are there. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, that, and actually that makes complete, that makes complete sense. Um, this is, so this is unrelated. This is, wasn't one of my questions, but I, I um, there was a university team that did a, a really detailed analysis of UFO reports and uh, somebody had given this to me. I believe it's published online. I just remember the address. And, and so they gave this to me a few years ago. And not surprisingly, the vast majority of UFO reports historically are near airports, right? Which, you know, because again, the, the, the interesting ones, I guess, as they say, are something like one in several thousand. And a lot of them are just misreported landing lights, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it, that would kind of go along the same lines, right? Of, of it's, you're going to see them where the jets are and you've got a lot of activity off the coasts. Um, yes, it depends, you know, uh, what your definition is of off the coast, right? Because when you, when we're talking about our working areas, you know, they're starting 10 miles off the coast. So the only people that should be operating any type of like UAVs would be like, your maybe like one off boat or like fisherman guy that's like down below like 3000 feet or so. I wouldn't be expecting to like continuously see us, you know, swarm of, of aerial vehicles um, day and night, right? So day and night, it, you know, and when I said every day earlier, um, again, we weren't tracking them, but we were accustomed to them so much that they, we put a notice out to airmen, it's called NOTAM, and it's something a pilot checks basically every time they go flying to an airport to say what's broken at the airport, what's wrong with it, the runway's down, the lights are out. We had one to say that there was unknown objects in our working area that we didn't know where they're from, right? So, I mean, that, that you can kind of see the frustration there that they just didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. Well, how how often, I mean, I, I'm guessing pilots, you, you mentioned the fellow in his gear, right? But pilots see more than they talk about, probably even with each other, and, and even less of that gets officially reported. H how often do you think that these events might happen to naval pilots in general and and does it damage or is it still damaging a pilot's reputation to report those I, the sense i'm getting to skip ahead is that it's it's no longer as damaging but you know it's it's a it's a community that's driven by tradition right and this there's actually a tradition of this in this community like it's you know i remember when i was you know very new to that community talking to old guys you know and they, they all had their stories you know and they some of them, some of them, it was, Hey, you know, Jerry's got a story, but he ain't going to tell you about it, you know, but uh, some guys would, and, you know, they were all interesting, but no one really was like digging into it. And it was all kind of just like, all right, you know, it wasn't serious. Um, but, you know, when we're almost hitting these things out there, it's a lot different than, you know, you know, seeing something perhaps in distance or on the radar, but every day that we're now briefing them as a safety consideration in our bright, in, in our briefs, you know, it takes it from the kind of like, oh, it, legendary stories we used to have to, you know, I need to make sure that my, my new wingman in the squadron who just came from the rag understands that there's objects out there that he could hit, you know, like that you may not be aware of like an actual safety consideration that we need to make sure that we brief uh, new pilots to. So it became extremely pragmatic uh, of an issue for us. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that that was exactly what was expressed in the hearings also, you know, is that it's, it's a safety concern. It's an unknown. I mean, there are a lot of practical, real reasons to understand what's going on, you know, in, in addition to larger scientific needs. Um, and I think that's the reason that the, one of the reasons that the military is beginning to take these things more seriously. And, and it, it looks like they're at least attempting to remove some of the stigma that's been associated with reporting encounters. Do you think that that stigma is, is going away? Do you think that their efforts are, are at least partially successful? And do you, do you have any ideas on what they could do to address this more directly? Yeah, I, I think it is going away, but I think I think generally speaking, they're going about the wrong way. Um, it needs to be a comprehensive, comprehensive data collection analysis effort that goes, you know, that's not gatekeep by whether the pilot just has enough time that day, right? 
Uh, we need to be able to ensure that the sensors that we're using to look at the coast, you know, in order to protect our country, you know, we have a system in place to ensure that what we're seeing isn't harmful to our country, isn't a strategic risk, isn't, you know, a tactical assault in some fashion as people are listening to um, our tactics or waveforms in order to get some type of tactical advantage against us, right? So, you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that those threats exist out there and that, you know, we have to be, we have to presume that, you know, that's the reality, not to say it's, an, you know, an adversarial tact we need to take, but we have to have confidence in our military that uh, the leadership cares about what our air crew and our operators are actually seeing out there when they report it back. And if the leadership isn't showing that they care, then at the end of the day, the operators you know, aren't going to waste their time with it. So the leadership needs to continue to express it and not just at the very top, but at the middle, you know, so at the 05, 06 level, um, that's where the support needs to come from. And I fear that that's likely maybe one of the hardest cohorts to turn over because, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a group of aviators that have been doing their job for a while. They haven't quite pulled into the Pentagon quite yet. So they're, you know, they're highly experienced and and a lot of times uh, set in their ways, perhaps uh, with the larger hours. So why change things now? But um, I think that's really where the push would have to be. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. have to be, again, UFO related, right? Like we, we should understand what, what potential threats are off our coast. We can't pretend like we're just, you know, invisible to the rest of the world and invincible to the rest of the world as well. Yeah, well, just total information awareness, right? And that would pick up UAPs. It's just we we want to know what's going on, you know, in, in every square centimeter of that airspace and for safety reasons and defense reasons and every reason, right? So if we don't do it now, it's going to be a continued problem, right? So fast forward 10 years and we have magnitudes more small form factor UAV traffic, right? We need to have the systems in place to one, ensure that those can operate safely with either existing or new air infrastructure in place. And two, it's a secure from attack, right? If we have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of UAVs, you know, supporting uh, customers and delivering packages and, you know, transplanting hearts across the country, we don't want people taking advantage of infrastructure and, and using that to attack pack us right so we need to have total awareness of that domain early because it's going to get away from us if we don't in my yeah. opinion yeah that makes sense well ryan thank you so much for sharing your story let me close by asking what comes next for you personally and and what do you anticipate seeing with the uap story in general as it continues to unfold yeah you know for myself right now um i'm really focused on two efforts um quantum generative materials. Uh, I am, you know, really excited about the technology we're building there. Um, we've, you know, it's been almost a year now since uh, I've joined the company and um, we're really excited to talk more about what we've been doing here in the near future. Um, and I've also been working with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, they asked me to help them stand up a, a committee at the national level in order to bring the various technical committees and integration groups at the AIAA across the country and bring those technical folks together in order to be ready to answer, um, you know, hard technical questions, to be able to interpret data, to be a trusted neutral source where we can, you know, be able to answer those questions across the military industrial complex, across the aerospace industry. We'll, we'll have access to all, you know, 30,000 plus of those engineers. And, you know, as we've been reaching out to them, I've, we've, they've been incredibly supportive, right? Uh, it's an all volunteer type activity and, you know, the, the emails back and support from, you know, everywhere from NASA to Lockheed Martin to, to Boeing uh, folks that are in this industry. Um, there's a lot of excitement. I, there's a lot of excitement about this. And, you know, I think the stigma in the industry is perhaps subsiding a bit as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Ryan, thank you again, sir. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Sam.